Great to see all of you uh, this beautiful Lord's Day morning. Uh, one of the, I guess, one of the benefits of going to the same church for many, many years is you get surprised. Uh, here's Luann Johnston Dixon. Some of you probably run. Uh, so glad to see you, as I said. So. Um, but we're going through the Gospel of Luke. So today uh, we're going to look at Luke 13, verses 10 through 21. Please turn in your Bibles there. We're in that middle portion of the Gospel in which Luke uh, portrays Jesus, you know, very busily engaged in uh, his earthly ministry, taking advantage of every opportunity to uh, teach the people while at the same time as occasions arise, displaying his divine uh, power to uh, make the sick well, these miraculous healings, uh, demonstrations of his power over Satan and his dominion. And while many along his path uh, marvel and rejoice at his works and give praise to God for them, there's also rising opposition, as we've seen, uh, at every turn, especially from the leaders of the Jews. But Jesus himself had come. We should remind ourselves of this. Uh, he was saying, uh, in order to fulfill the promises made by the prophets, he said the kingdom of God was now at hand. And consequently, uh, the Lord has been repeatedly warning his listeners of the urgency to repent and believe his words and believe in the gospel uh, while they still have time because judgment awaits for those who refuse him. And as we beginning, begin reading in uh, verse 10 of chapter 13 against this backdrop of the hypocrisy and unbelief of the Jewish leaders, Jesus is going to put on display again uh, the healing power God has given him in the person of a woman, uh, how often he ministered to women, but in the person of a woman suffering from a crippling spinal uh, condition. Uh, yet another demonstration of the presence and power of God's kingdom found in him. So let's begin reading in verse 10 of chapter 13, where Luke writes that, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, there are six days in which work should be done. So come during them and get healed and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered and said, uh, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham, as she is, that was important to God, that was important to Christ, that she was a daughter of Abraham, uh, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated, and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. So he was saying, and here uh, we have, uh, we talk about it a lot uh, here, uh, teaching the Bible, hearing the Bible taught. These little words that appear in our text, they're important. We, we ought not to overlook them. So uh, mine says, so, yours may say, your translation may say, therefore. But he's drawing an inference here as he switches from one 
section of our passage to the next, verse 18. So, uh, therefore he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like and to what shall I compare it? It's like a mustard seed, which a man took and threw into his own garden and it grew and became a tree and the birds of the air nested in its branches. And again, he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. There are many benefits to uh, reading through the Bible in a year. I know some of you are doing that. Some of you do it every year. Some of you uh, don't. It's, it's difficult to find time uh, to do it. This always reminds me of Dr. Johnson uh, years ago would, uh, let's be honest, brag about how he was reading through the Bible. About this time of the year, March, April, he'd find reason to say, you know, I'm just finished reading through the Bible. I'm about to start it up again. And uh, Martha would accuse him of bragging. He said, I'm not bragging, I'm just encouraging. Uh, but I use a version myself, not bragging. I use a version uh, that every day you have a New Testament reading and an Old Testament reading. In fact, I think it's the, the reading guide that's out in the foyer. And, and this year, uh, teaching through this Gospel of Luke, it's allowed me uh, to benefit from Matthew and Mark's uh, accounts. And I've been struck, after all these years, I've been struck by uh, the sheer number of miraculous healings, uh, the variety of healings, uh, casting out of demons, cleansing lepers, feeding the thousands, uh, drying up the woman uh, with the, the bleeding issue, um, feeding thousands, calming the stormy seas, even raising the dead to life. And when Jesus began his public ministry, uh, it was mainly a teaching and preaching uh, ministry. According to Matthew and Mark, his main message was the need for people to repent because the kingdom of God was at hand. That's Matthew 4, 17. It's Mark 1, verses 14 and following. It was the fulfillment of what the forerunner, uh, John the Baptist, had spoken before him as the one preparing his way. Eventually, uh, John, imprisoned by Herod, and sent his disciples, you know, to ask Jesus, are you the expected one, uh, or should we look for someone else? And Jesus' answer was, go and report to John what you see and hear. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So Jesus' miracles were part of the attesting evidence that he was the Messiah, and they were a foretaste of the kingdom blessings he was to bring into existence. And that explains the therefore of, of the 18th verse of our passage, of following immediately after the healing of the bent woman. Therefore, he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like? Uh, much like his other miracles, the healing had put on display the breadth and the magnificent power the king intended to bring about as he gathered up those who would be citizens in his kingdom. Well, as the account begins, uh, we find the Lord engaged in teaching the people, the, the mainstay, again, of his ministry. Uh, students of the gospel typically take note that this is the last time he is portrayed in the gospels uh, participating in a synagogue uh, meeting. Whether that is precisely true or not, uh, Luke chooses not to identify the location of this particular synagogue or the pr precise setting as it relates to what has come before and what is about to come after, only that it took place on one of the Sabbaths. As the story progressive, uh, the, progresses, that fact threatens to overtake 
what ought to have been the most notable feature, uh, the woman who had been bent double for 18 years and whom Jesus, in loving mercy, miraculously healed. A normal reading of Luke's account would not lead us to expect Jesus to have, humanly speaking, known about the woman. Uh, she was present there, and while Jesus was in the midst of his teaching, he, he saw her. Sadly, she would have stuck out. Uh, she had an illness that forced her to be bent over double. Luke, the physician, uh, carefully observes it, it's likely she suffered either from a condition known today as spondylitis ankylopoietica or another known as spondylitis deformans, uh, both uh, fusions of the spinal bones that rendered them a rigid mass. Luke notes that the sickness was caused by a spirit, and while he doesn't say uh, clearly that she was demon-possessed, we can at least believe that she was demon-obsessed, oppressed, I should say, and we know for sure that the devil himself was her tormentor because Jesus states it plainly in verse 16. But it was a cruel affliction, as I think we can all picture in our minds. Uh, for one thing, we have seen people uh, who have suffered uh, like this. Um, Perhaps some of you may even know someone who is suffering from a crippling disease like this, but they stand out. Uh, they catch the eye as they make their way around, uh, quite like others, but with their bodies contorted so that their back is arched instead of upright. Kent Hughes described well what she must have looked like in her own experience. She was like a hobbled animal she lived in a posture of forced humility, her face always toward the dust of the earth, unless she wrenched sideways and, and peered upward like an awkward animal. She seemed to sink lower and lower as the weight of years pressed upon her. Her gait was a lunging shuffle. And yet this woman's spiritual focus uh, was upward. Uh, she was evidently a regular worshiper at the synagogue because no one took special note of her that we can tell. Uh, due to her, her infirmity, it would have been much easier to stay at home. Uh, many of we, we frequently stay at home for reasons much less than this. Uh, but to her credit, she sought the solace of worship and, and the word and, and the fellowship of, of uh, her fellow uh, a believer. She had lived like that for 18 long years. But as so often was the case with our Lord, he, he saw her. He saw her. It, it, it seems his eyes were always on the lookout for the miserable and, and needy, those whom he knew with divine intuition were to be the objects of his loving pity. Uh, like Levi, uh, the tax collector whom Jesus noticed in chapter 5. And like another tax collector, Zacchaeus, in chapter 19, whom Jesus, passing by, looked up into uh, the tree and, and saw him and, and begged him, hurry and come down, today I must stay at your house. Uh, both of those two social miscreants uh, were to be saved by Jesus. And likewise now here, seeing the woman, he spontaneously felt compassion for her and, and called her over and said to her in a tender and assuring tone, woman, you are freed from your sickness. She had been bound by Satan and now Jesus set her free. And though she had to have felt it immediately. Perhaps it took her a moment to really believe it because Jesus proceeded to lay his hands on her, uh, lovingly giving her the confidence to stand erect again. And after so many years, uh, no longer uh, bent, but straightened upright. That's what the, the language infers, straight and upright. Uh, a rush of, of triumph, 
uh, mixed with gratitude, uh, surged within her as the certainty of her restoration became clear. And, and Luke describes how she began glorifying God. After this initial uh, glowing recognition that she had been healed, her first impulse was to glorify God. Uh, no one could have known better than this long-suffering woman. It could only have been God who had healed her. The members of the synagogue uh, no doubt joined in with her joy and, and with her praise uh, to God, uh, but not all of them. The, the synagogue official was present uh, this Sabbath day. He was uh, the figure selected to be responsible for the arrangements uh, of the synagogue uh, meetings, uh, the services, and so typically the official was in alignment with the Jewish authorities and a fixture at uh, the meetings that took place there in order to enforce their customs and their uh, guidelines. And he exhibits that allegiance uh, here, uh, displaying the same distorted uh, view of the Sabbath that characterizes the scribes and the Pharisees uh, throughout the Gospels and with whom Jesus had countless uh, run-ins. Uh, he demonstrates that official mainstream Judaism here. Luke characterizes him in verse 14 as being indignant uh, that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. There's more than one kind of indignation, of course. There is righteous indignation, and then there's this misguided indignation. And he began saying to the crowd in response to the miracle, there are six days, six days in which uh, work should be done. So come during them and get healed and not on the Sabbath day. The prescription against working on uh, the Sabbath day was the fourth commandment of the uh, Decalogue. Uh, the official clearly knew it well. Uh, it is Exodus 20 verse 9, as you know. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Well, after the law was given, uh, as the people of Israel uh, continued their wanderings in the wilderness, that fourth commandment was strictly enforced in Numbers uh, 15, there's an incident of a man found gathering up wood uh, on the, the Sabbath day, and the witnesses uh, brought him before Moses and Aaron and all the congregation, and they put him in custody, uh, and then the Lord rendered the verdict upon the lawbreaker, and the Lord instructed them uh, to put him to death, and they did. They put him to death. So the evidence is clear. The Lord was jealous for the Sabbath day, and he made it a holy day on which people were to rest and not work. It was grounded in creation itself and was a, a means of honoring God. It was not a trivial thing to him. Well, we've covered this before, so there's no need to explain it in great detail, but, but by this time in history, the Jewish scribes and uh, the rabbinical leaders had so laden uh, God's original law with added restrictions and embellishments that the original uh, intent of the laws was often almost lost. Uh, we characterize them as building fences around uh, the law to ensure that the commandments were not violated, uh, fences to keep us within uh, the, the meaning of the law and, and adherence to the law. But it so often happens with people who are uh, drawn to empty religion, their embellishments uh, became a source of pride and, and social distinction. Uh, Jesus, you know, repeatedly took them to task for their uh, distortion and the true significance of the Sabbath was perhaps the greatest 
bone of contention between them. Uh, that, that difference about the meaning and importance of the Sabbath. And you'll notice the official did not direct his, this cold criticism against the Lord, but toward the crowd. Uh, such was the weight of Jesus' presence. He didn't dare take Jesus himself to task. But the Lord didn't hesitate. Uh, he answered the official and said, You hypocrites, uh, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? Of course they did. And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? They were hypocrites, uh, the synagogue official and all that took the same position as him because of the special care they accorded to their domestic animals while showing little care for uh, their fellow children of Abraham, for whom God, in any event, had shown the most tender care from the very birth, from their very birth, and for century upon century. Uh, so this was fence building at its very worst, somehow finding the common sense freedom to make allowance for their animals to be fed and watered on the Sabbath and tying and untying them for that purpose in order to assure they didn't stray, logical things uh, to do, and they interpreted the law in such a way to allow uh, for it, but apparently not allowing relief for one of God's own chosen, uh, suffering uh, pitifully from this crippling disease, and that for 18 agonizing years. Earlier in his ministry, in Mark chapter 2, uh, Mark pictures Jesus and his disciples walking through the grain fields. And his disciples begin picking these uh, ears of, of grain off the, the stalks uh, and eating them. And some Pharisees uh, saw them and demanded to know why they were doing uh, such an un unlawful thing on the Sabbath. And the Lord uh, quickly again, took up the argument with them and concluded the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Well, that same <clears throat> sentiment, that idea, though expressed diff di differently, is, is uh, the same here. God did not intend for the Sabbath to supersede common sense or, or prohibit uh, compassion. Satan had bound, that's the word uh, used, Satan had bound this poor woman in a condition not even to be compared to the binding of a donkey on a rail in a, in a stable. And the compassionate Christ let loose kingdom power upon the devil and upon the woman, revealing for all who had eyes to see his own identity as the promised king. God's ways... His laws and, and testimonies and ordinances, uh, His will, in other words, for our lives are meant for joy and, and good. When we abide by them, they are not punitive or meant to take away. Instead, they invite us into the joy and fellowship of peace and fulfillment in the only one in whom such blessing can be found. That's the purpose of the laws of God. And Jesus was the embodiment of that. Uh, the things he said and everything he did were perfect in every way. But as always, they had a polarizing effect on those who entered into his orbit. Uh, verse 17 describes the twofold effect in this case, those who rejected him were humiliated and unable to refute his bold answer, but the vast majority of the crowd, it seems, could not help but rejoice over the glorious things being done by him. They might not have been able to explain it, but kingdom power was in the air. And perhaps that was what led the Lord to then ask in verse 18, 
the rhetorical question of the crowds, what is the kingdom of God like and to what shall I compare it? Something in what had just occurred in the synagogue led to the question because Luke introduces it with that little inferential particle, so, or therefore. Therefore, he was saying, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? Something uh, led him to utilize two familiar uh, symbols, the mustard tree and leaven, to introduce those two symbols to describe in comparison form what the kingdom of God is like. Now, historically, there have been uh, two major but different interpretations of his intent. Uh, Both uh, views have arguments in their favor, and both, ironically, argue to some degree from the immediate context in order to explain the little connecting uh, so. And lastly, both also, uh, rather pleasingly, I think, Uh, offer valuable lessons consistent with other scriptural teaching. Well, the comparisons themselves seem simple on the surface. The kingdom of God is like a a mustard seed, which a man took, he planted it, it grew, it became a tree, so that the birds of the air um, nested in its branches. That makes sense. We see that in nature. This was a familiar figure for Jesus. Uh, Both Matthew and Mark uh, record the Lord using the same symbol in a a different uh, setting, both of those placing an emphasis on how tiny uh, the mustard seed is from which such a large large bush or tree grows. Uh, Estimates of the size of a mature mustard tree range from... 10 feet to 15 feet or uh, more, uh, easily large enough for birds to uh, find room on its branches, branches to perch or to shelter in the shade of its leaves. But then the Lord again <clears throat> offers a different comparison in verse 21. The kingdom of God is like leaven which a woman took and and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. We have a few cooks uh, here among us who enjoy uh, baking. I have benefited from their ministry. Uh, This will sound very familiar to, to them. Uh, They put just a little yeast or, or leaven into a larger amount, you can tell I don't know what I'm talking about, but into a larger amount of flour, and then they let it rest for a a period of time, generally overnight, and if the conditions have been right, uh, the next day there's a large loaf for them uh, to bake for their friends. (laughs) The idea is that uh, leaven is not static. It is constituted to grow. But this is where interpreters have gone off in different directions. One interpretation sees in the comparisons a a negative connotation, finding in both birds and in leaven references to malicious uh, forces, evil influences, in opposition to the advance of the gospel and God's kingdom. Uh, Those in the other camp uh, view the comparisons in a positive vein. Uh, They see in the growth of the mustard seed a a picture of the growth of uh, the kingdom from small beginnings and in the birds nesting in its branches, a picture of the universal uh, offer of the kingdom to the nations of the world and in the leaven's effect, the steady and powerful growth of the kingdom. Well, now let's look at the arguments for and against each and at the lessons to be found in each. Uh, we you know, are restricted by time, so this is, this is my effort to give you both sides 
Uh, first, the view that Jesus was comparing the kingdom to these figures in a negative way. Uh, birds. Birds are often symbols of opponents of God's works of mercy in the lives of his people. Uh, you remember in Genesis chapter 15, when God wished to um, make this covenant or, or uh, reassert this covenant with Abraham, he asked, he to, commanded Abraham to bring uh, these animals. Uh, and he had them cut, him, cut them in two, you know this, and put them across from each other on, on the ground so that he would pass through and uh, affirm the covenant, seal, seal the covenant with Abraham. And uh, that's what Abraham did. But then uh, the birds uh, came and, and attacked, and uh, uh, they, they, uh, he had to fight them off, uh, insinuating that though God's promises would be true, and though, though his kingdom which would steadily advance, there would inevitably be opposition, just like Abraham encountered. Just, and just like the synagogue official uh, who objected to the miraculous healing on the Sabbath. That makes a lot of sense. Then, again, in Jesus' parable of the sower and the soils, uh, remember the seed which fell beside uh, the road. The birds came. The birds came and, and ate up uh, the seed, and Jesus interpreted it for the disciples. They came to us, tell us what, what this parable is all about. And he started with, with the seed that fell on the side of the road, and he interpreted it. He, he, he said uh, uh, it represented those who hear the word when it's sowed, but when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. So the birds represent Satan. In, in the parable. And as for the comparison to leaven, I think we all know that leaven is very often used in the Bible as a symbol for the corrosive effects of evil and sin. In the Jewish ceremonies of Passover and unleavened bread, by definition, the strict command was that there could be no leaven found in the homes of those observing the feast. There was no place for sin in the ceremony of Passover and of unleavened bread. I can keep going. Paul, uh, the apostle, used leaven as a symbol for the pervasive effect of sin in the church. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6, after reproving that church for uh, condoning horrible sin in the church and allowing the perpetrator to remain among them, he, he challenged them, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. So it's entirely possible that the Lord observed uh, the cold and obtuse objections of the synagogue official, and he used these comparisons to warn against a naive confidence that the kingdom might advance and, and sail through, we might say, without the need for significant diligence and watchfulness and without the certainty of constant opposition. Those who uh, take these views see the figure as Jesus' warning against that kind of complacency. Uh, for he knew there would be much that would threaten uh, his church. He knew the inevitability of false teaching that would lead people astray and the, the natural tendency of the flesh to tempt men to evil and destruction. He knew the destructive nature of the world and the world's uh, goods, their treasures, and the desire for the world's approval, which tend to subtly shift even a believer's prior priorities at times. That is what the kingdom of God is like, he was saying, as it would advance in the world and, and for the long sojourn ahead. But there's now... The other view concerning these kingdom comparisons, this view takes them as Jesus' more triumphant lesson to derive from what had just transpired. It speculates that Jesus was reflecting uh, more on the power implicit in his kingdom as his healing of the woman had just demonstrated. And also as uh, the response of the entire crowd reinforced. 
This is the view that I quite hesitantly take myself, uh, thinking it fits better the underlying spirit of the account, the ultimate triumph of the encounter, and significantly the context of the following passage, Lord willing, we'll be looking at it, uh, which lays stress on the entrance into the kingdom, uh, the narrow door through which they will come, uh, the discriminating grace of God in choosing its occupants, and above all, the bell-ringing statement of verse 29, you can read it there, that they will come from east and west and from north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. That sounds a little bit like a mustard tree, uh, which began with a seed uh, described in Matthew and Mark as smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, but then it grew, Jesus says here, and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. Uh, So the logic is of a giant tree growing up out of the tiniest of beginnings, and the Old Testament citation uh, concerning the birds is a quotation from Ezekiel 17, 23, uh, the phrase appearing in the midst of a messianic prophecy asserting that God will provide the Messiah from David's line, taking the future branch of that tree and growing it into a stately cedar in which birds of every kind will nest under it. They will nest in the shade of its branches. Under Messiah's rule, all kingdoms will be blessed, not just Israel. Understanding the parable in this way requires that we allow the reference to birds to take on a different sense than what we mentioned earlier, one more aligned with the use in Ezekiel. In this interpretation, the significance of the metaphor is, like the tiny mustard seed growing into a mighty tree, so with Jesus' kingdom, What appears tiny and insignificant to some will prove to have been the beginning of a mighty kingdom, and the entire world will enjoy its fruits. The kingdom will be universal. Perhaps your own uh, personal testimony reflects that kind of imagery. You may trace your own salvation back to small beginnings, but God in Christ has been building and, and growing it in Surely others have joined in with you in entering the kingdom. Understanding the parable in this way will also require a kinder interpretation of leaven. Uh, Though it undeniably represents evil opposition to God in frequent places as here, it might logically be viewed without that uh, baggage and seen in the sense of the powerful pervading influence the kingdom of God would have. And one can imagine Jesus as a young boy watching his mother prepare bread. And now he borrows uh, what he observed then to describe uh, the kingdom. A.B. Bruce, the 19th century Scottish churchman and theologian, conceded in his commentary on Luke that leaven was typically an emblem for evil. But here, Bruce wrote, Jesus had the courage to use it as an emblem of the best thing in the world, the kingdom of God coming into the heart of the individual and of the community. It is powerful and changes everything. Like yeast or leaven, it works uh, perhaps silently and in a hidden way in the heart of a person, but it eventually manifests itself in power that can only be considered supernatural. It works from the inside. Its power is idle in it till it takes root in the heart of a person. Yet its activating source is not internally generated, but must come from outside. Only the heavenly baker can start it and make it grow. This is the other view. And I would hope we can all agree that both interpretations are rational, and both communicate valuable lessons that, if not the actual intent of Jesus at the time, are nevertheless truths we learn from other places in the Scriptures. Well, I want to add before we close, very little time left, 
in the history of the church and its interpretation of scripture, some have taken these growth parables and imagined that they predicted an ever increasing growth of the church on earth until evil and opposition to the gospel would be eradicated and, and God would usher in his earthly kingdom in that order. And those post-millennial views of the late 19th and, and early 20th century Christians were largely squashed by the uh, mid-20th century, dashed by the uh, dissolution of two world wars and the steady decline in public morality. But the emphasis of the parables is on the power of God in growing his kingdom. First, in the church, but ultimately in the millennial kingdom, he has prophesied to bring about in the order of events revealed to us in Scripture. Uh, Jesus told his disciples that he would build his church and the gates of Hades would not overpower it. And that's what he is doing now. And we are gladly evidence of it. Opposition is guaranteed but Christ's power will prevail. And we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's the posture of citizens of the kingdom. It's our longing. And our king is even now, uh, perhaps slowly as we perceive its progress, but surely, uh, powerfully, bringing the world to that place at which Evil will be vanquished, and God's kingdom will be ushered in on this earth. What a blessing to be a part of it. Amen. Father, thank you uh, for the sweet promises that are here. Uh, we come to a passage like this where we're not quite sure exactly uh, the full meaning, but we know uh, that the truth that is there is wonderful, and it is in the passage we just read. We thank you that your kingdom is powerful. It's irrepressible. Uh, you uh, will not allow it uh, to be slowed by anything on earth or above the earth. Our future is certain, and you have made us citizens of that kingdom. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.